Oh, mm. well, basically, this is a small presentation. There, I, I use this presentation to introduce uh, basically uh, this is a kind of science. It's called here uh, Art Diagnostics, Cultural Heritage Science, Conservation Science. So, basically, the idea is uh, to apply uh, science to cultural heritage. So, art, wall painting, manuscripts historical documents, and uh, in order to provide information to the art professionals, so curator, uh, museum conservators, uh, art appraisers, if you want to be in the art market, in order to um, answer questions. Uh, questions could be about the materials and the methods the object are made. So for example, how it was made, what kind of pigments, what kind of paint, who made it? So this is a more specifically to attributions of painters, Caravaggio, Rembrandt. And uh, the idea is so uh, I know basically what kind of, if the materials are historical, if the materials are modern, the technique how they were used, if it's uh, related to that painters or not. And then uh, another big question so that science uh, can answer is uh, how these objects, these collections, could be better preserved. So I know the material, so, so I can understand the degradation progress, the degradation processes that take place for these specific objects. OK, so basically, uh, an idea just uh, so we have a painting, we look at the back of a painting. The back of a painting often has a lot of information regarding attribution, the history of the painting. So for example, in the infrared the photography, one of these diagnostic methods reveal what was not visible with the naked eye, you know, because we have contrast, the material, pigments, absorb, and stuff. Yeah, there is too much light, OK? And uh, so basically, mm, myself, I've been uh, in this sector now for 17 years. So I started with my PhD thesis uh, there in Italy. And uh, I've been working on a different of these uh, techniques applied for art examination in different institutions in uh, Europe, also in the uh, US, the Metropolitan Museum. Uh, in, uh, in California, there was a center. Um, so you see, there are plenty of technical methods that can be applied to answer questions in this uh, field. Uh, then uh, uh, in 2012, I left academia, where I was working there, and I started my own uh, little initiative. Uh, and the reason was because I noticed there was uh, a gap between uh, this, uh, this uh, research, it's scientific research, that actually is done by academic, academic uh, institutions, and uh, what was uh, really needed in the field from really art professionals. So I wanted to build like, a little bit of a, a bridge between these two worlds, uh, academic, where I belong anyway, and uh, the art professional world. So basically, the idea is that uh, if you are an academic, you want to make publications, scientific publications, these research or these applications in art, study material. But the applications, you know, these publications often they have to use expensive equipment. You want to be, uh, of course, if you want to public uh, on uh, on uh, nature, you need to have something really cool in your hand. And uh, the scientific uh, publications are aimed at scientists, other scientists, so not art conservators. So they have a lot of maths, introduction with uh, theory formulas that art professional do not belong to. And then, uh, anyway, the materials that academia, the technique that academia uses, uh, require a lot of skills. Of course, like you need PhD students, uh, full professors in order to operate the machine and interpret also the data. On the other hand, we have uh, the art professional world, where we have uh, these uh, people that have already to take care of the their collection with uh, often limited resources. So this is a big issue, let's say, in, uh, in the art world. Uh, it is not as, uh, let's say, uh, well-founded as could be medicine, for example, or clinical research. 
So they are much bigger value, they have much bigger volume of funds of a public interest. Uh, the cultural heritage, you know, is always in any country, in any period of time, uh, reserve limited resources. So it means that uh, we need really to focus on a practical workflow, device, ideas that can be done and be uh, successful with a little bit of resources. And so basically, the cultural heritage science open source uh, initiative wanted to bring some of these uh, science, of this uh, technology, into the art professional world. But uh, these have to be practical methods. So basically, this initiative is based there uh, in, uh, in Italy, in this small village. Uh, this is uh, my studio over there. And uh, we have this uh, master plan. So the mission is a uh, promote practical technologies for us dissemination. We see this term practical has a, a wide range of meanings specific. And, uh, and basically practical means that uh, even art professionals, so not only academic, academic professionals, can use this technology to benefit the art, actually the heritage, the cultural heritage world. Um, so this plan started with developing these uh, practical tools, of course. And so basically, uh, the idea is that uh, every here, sorry, over there, we can uh, basically start to focus on uh, a specific kind of equipment and making a practical version of it. So basically, it's not like develop new signs, new detectors, because uh, it's a uh, it's just a small initiative. The idea is that to make a package, a product, that then an art museum, a small, medium art museum, can implement in their workflow. So basically, we are not aiming the top big museums, like the National Gallery, the British Museum, because those museums, they already have a funds, scientists working in their department, the conservation department, department, scientific research department. So they do their own research with plenty of funds, they develop specific tools, costly tools. We are aiming at small, medium-sized museum cultural institutions. So the idea now, uh, what it matters is that uh, uh, nowadays we have degree printers, Arduino electronics, Stepper motors, laser engravers. Basically, now we have this little bit of uh, uh, technological revolution where basically everyone can be a maker of tools, even scientific tools, in terms of uh, scanners, uh, detectors that with light applied and um, circuitry that we can design. So basically, even in this uh, small sector of cultural heritage, basically we can have an impact and we can make our art examination tools. This is important because uh, tools developed by art professionals, for art professionals, this makes a, a really big difference. Because let's say, when I was in academia, I was just a buyer. So I went online, uh, contacted by the company, and they said, okay, we have this new camera over here, this, this, uh, can, you can do this, and this, uh, we have a camera. Um, so we were just buyers. So they had a product, a product not developed for the art sector, a product just developed for whatever market they could sell that camera, and so we just had to buy it, and that's all. On the other hand, uh, thanks to this uh, technological revolution, so myself, I wasn't, I'm a physicist, but I wasn't trained in electronics and doing uh, Arduino things, you know, these uh, microcontroller stuff. But I just go online, download materials, start to learn. And basically, anybody has uh, this electronic revolution also for artists. You know, we have, like, here, just uh, yesterday, we met Raphael. Uh, he's an artist, but he knows how to do electronic sensor, develop things. So there is these things also applied for our sector. So basically, since I'm, this, I have, we have in the CHSOS this experience in art conservation, we do art, art examination 
in particular ourselves, for our clients, museum collectors, we know what are the scientific tools that better fit the needs of this sector. And so, here we have a practical. This means, what means practical? It means, first of all, low cost. We are a, at the medium, small museum, institutions, and studios, conservation studios, for example. So, but in order to be practical, it must be something that these people can afford. Uh, yeah, there is a video I uh, show this one uh, any time. Uh, it's kind of funny. So, Do you know the guy? Maybe you know him because I saw him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good to put this video so you make a little break. And also, for me, I can bring some, some water and enjoy. Should put another one in, in, in another break, in another part. Uh, so, so little... yeah. I mean, yeah, just in getting there. I mean, uh... Okay, thank you. So basically, the idea uh, of this video is that uh, what not equipment. So I thought when I was in the career, there was this uh, thing about buying the latest uh, spectrum mirrors that uh, have these uh, things more a little bit. So there was this uh, pressure on buying stuff, which was actually boosted by the government. So, say, uh, so the idea is that uh, if you have a passion for something, even with a simple tool like a toy guitar, you can still uh, serve your sector. In particular, for us, you know, working cultural heritage is about serving this uh, preservation of cultural heritage, of museums, of culture. So, um, and also, low cost means uh, maintenance of the equipment, because I mean, uh, this, I'm, I come from uh, the first experience, 20 years in academia, I saw plenty of equipment, costly equipment, bought, and then after a few years, it became unavailable, unusable maintenance problem, because maybe, you know, just a software upgrade, not working with computers, the new software, the new, uh, the new operating system, plenty of this situation. So, the idea is uh, to have something low cost and easy to, man to maintain. And then uh, another big, uh, quite big, uh, big um, phrase is do not use a cannon to kill a mosquito. So uh, I, mean, I have a plenty of this example in our cultural heritage research, it's also in academia, where basically we were using expensive equipment, uh, making paper, just to answer a question that could be answered immediately, just I mean, looking at the object with a magnifying glass. Okay? So basically, we, the idea was to avoid these errors. Um, so they want to spectral imaging, yeah. So an example of this was uh, people selling, companies selling this multispectral imaging system, that also a topic of the day, multispectral imaging. Uh, these cameras for multispectral imaging are expensive because they are super sensitive cameras. So they need just, uh, they are very fast, so they need just a few light. Um, and the reason is because they are developed for applications in uh, waste control, uh, satellite monitoring, 
Uh, so really, uh, having very sensitive cameras is very important. But, uh, I mean, uh, in our sector, cultural heritage, we are uh, analyzing manuscripts, paintings. They don't move. I mean, we can stay there at any shadow speed of one second, two seconds, one minute, and it doesn't matter. So we could just use something else, much more inexpensive, that a multispectral imaging camera that's uh, expensive. So, uh, this is about low cost. Then uh, we have fast art professional LBC. So art professional are my target. Art professional means these people that is doing restoration, conservation, fixing painting, cleaning, wall paintings, this kind of thing. So they are already busy with the work. What I want to do is provide them with tools where they can improve their workflow. So if they do, they are cleaning wall painting. Maybe using some UV fluorescence photography can help them in monitoring how they are cleaning the wall painting. But this process has to be fast, easy, because they are already busy with the plenty of work. Uh, and easy, in particular. So this is the same example of the group is still around, of the vacuum cleaner. There are plenty of uh, vacuum robot cleaners that have been developed over here, but often you at home, you always have your own room, a little bit of things. Because the room is simple, so tools that are easy, simple, prevalent, often are the ones that you eventually are using more. Okay, so it is uh, provide them with easy tools, something compact, easy, so that they actually use them in their workflow. Uh, and then, uh, Practical means adaptable. A Ferrari is beautiful. You want to have a Ferrari in your laboratory. So, say like a it looks great. So everybody is just focusing on, uh, on the Ferrari. But uh, consider the practicality of uh, Italian Cinquecento. I mean, with the Ferrari, you can go just uh, on a highway, maybe. So the path, the road should be perfect. Maybe in Puerto Rico you're going to have some little issue. You know, with the Ferrari, you know. You know, uh, it's not to be a little bit, you know. With the Cinquecento in Puerto Rico, you're fine. It's, uh, you know, it's a lightweight car. It goes anywhere. Some people, um, dirty roads, whatever. So the idea is to have or just to focus on the tools that are not shiny, has a Ferrari, but can be used in a different situation, or in a, I mean, in a cultural heritage diagnostics, uh, adaptability means uh, one day I'm working on a high scaffolding to do wall paintings, a diagnostics in the church, for example. Another day I'm working on a manuscript, delicate, so I need a, a different kind of setup. Uh, other times it will be paintings, I have to go to museum, and there are large collections, so this is adaptability. So every Ferrari, Often it means that the Ferrari is nice just in certain environment. Uh, yeah, and this uh, compromise is, uh, is important uh, because uh, in academia, when we do our publication, we need to do, say that we have did the best conditions. But uh, in our culture, for art really professionals, we have the question of always limited resources. Funding, limited funding, limited time from the operator for that profession to use this equipment to do that. So we need basically to use as less uh, resources as possible in order to provide reasonably good data. Finally, so basically, you see, this is an approach very different from what I could see that what I was doing in academia, in academia myself. Uh, so develop. Uh, yeah, so here yeah, in the master plan, so the idea so is that promote practical, so we saw what practical means. Now, so this method, I have to develop this method. So every here is, um, is one of these, so it was a technical photography first. Taking a photography basically means, uh, now, the idea, taking a photography has been uh, known and applied for uh, decades. But my idea is, was to create a package, so that basically has we did here, you take one day training and you're ready to operate this uh, package. That means knowledge, uh, equipment, very easy, um, sturdy stuff. Uh, basically responding to the, all the practical meanings. 
So basically, they can offer dollar, it means that they, we can use a commercial, so also the low cost, just a commercial digital camera modified that you see basically through the ultraviolet to the near infrared. And basically, with this uh, camera and the set of just uh, four filters, we can obtain a series on a painting of uh, technical photography, so it will be visible to the uh, fluorescence, it will be reflected, the infrared, infrared post color, infrared the fluorescence, infrared reflectography, actually with another tool. But um, basically, we can obtain all these images, and each one of these e technical images, scientific imaging, provide a bit of different information on the art object that will be useful for the conservation, for the authentication, for the understanding of the materials. So, just a few examples for those who are totally new to this field. Uh, with this uh, technical photography, we can see through dirt already. So here is uh, an icon, visible image, infrared image. Over there you see, basically the dirt becomes transparent be even before any cleaning has been applied. So we see much more of the details over there. Uh, here we have the back of a painting with a lot of varnish, old varnish, yellowish. We do infrared the photography and that disappears and things become clear. Uh, we can see pentimenti and the changes, so photo and visible, so the error over there is in a way longer. Uh, we can differentiate different kinds of inks, visible photography, infrared photography, these inks become transparent while the other ones not. So this is because there are different kinds, carbon-based ink, uh, another one is iron gold ink. Uh, faded inks also, again, here we have uh, a print in the visible photo, a print in the UVF that becomes more contrasted and readable. Uh, of course, uh, UV for photography is used to understand areas that have been retouched, so the original visible UVS. Um, also, to understand where there are retouched pigments, visible photo, and this is it, the infrared force color. On the, on the right, top right, there is a restoration of the sky, and so the post score are different. So these are all information that the restorers can use to plan the conservation treatment, for example, the, that wall painting. Then there is uh, all the world of underdrawing, so being able to see the sketches the painters made, uh, and then they cover it. So um, it's used particularly for attributions, Okay, then basically we use infrared in different methods, we saw them in the course. There is this technique of infrared fluorescence that is to identify the presence of cadmium pigments in a painting. Cadmium pigments are uh, modern pigments, so that's why in a historical pigment, in a, in, and in a historical painting, we don't expect to find the modern pigments. So with this technique, we can immediately figure out where they are. Uh, okay, so this is uh, basically uh, this, uh, also an idea of these art methods but here that I use for my professional um, practice. Technical photography we just saw over there in the top. Then in 2014 it was about uh, panoramic infrared reflectography. So basically, we are with this infrared reflectography, we mean where we are working on. Uh, this is a further area of the infrared. And this is important, we use another kind of detector, the INGAS camera. And uh, the idea is that, you see, this is a photo of a draw of a painting, detail. This is the infrared done with a full spectrum camera, digital camera modified, what we saw just before. This is infrared photography. We see much better the underdrawing for here. So for this examination, the drawing, the pigments becomes much more transparent using that further uh, part of the spectrum. And so basically the idea was to build a new kind of uh, fast and low cost uh, scanners. Because basically before they were the scanner, but were very expensive, large, bulky stuff. Um, then uh, 2015, multispectral imaging. So basically, multispectral imaging is when I have a painting, 
and basically acquiring a number of spectral images, specific bases, then I can make a post-color map and identify the different materials that are on the painting. So basically this is useful for, uh, to basically for restorers, conservators, to identify areas that have been retouched because they're going to have colors with the same uh, colors, basically pigments with the same colors will have different post colors or they will show up. So they have all this information. And uh, another application is also, uh, is also for uh, uh, making uh, basically historical documents or paintings, wall paintings that are faded to make them more readable. So basically playing with the bandwidth, we can enhance the reading of this. Um, so these are basically the tools, some other tools that we've been developing. Uh, also, Timides is the last one. So this is uh, Antonello, is uh, basically the name are based on uh, Sicilian famous uh, historical figures. So we have uh, uh, Archimedes, our best scientist at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a scan uh, with, you see the stepper motors, so it's designed for uh, manuscripts, because manuscripts have to be flat. So we need a system to, uh, to do this technical photography, but on objects that have to be flat. Uh, and the is the multispectral imaging system, and, uh, and Gorgias is also a new reflectance system for spectroscopy. Uh, this is also something that we are developing currently. This is the pigment check, it's a collection of uh, historical pigments, and this is meant basically for education. So these are certified standards of historical pigments, so that basically universities, uh, uh, research centers, uh, they want to use in order to practice these uh, uh, analytical methods, imaging, the spectroscopy on standards, reference standards. Uh, okay, so this is uh, where we are distributing. Okay, so this was about this master plan of uh, developing our tool. So every here we try to add a little bit of a new tools to focus on that. And you know, we can do this uh, because uh, we are art professional already. You know, I'm working myself, you see over here an art examination service. So basically we can know what is needed in the field. This is, a, I mean, a, it's a, a very different approach than what has happened before, because before there were like uh, the, the big company making spectrometers, and they make a spectrometer for industry, for uh, automotive, whatever, and then also they try to sell something to the cultural heritage sector. In this case, the CHSOS initiative is made of art professional producing tool for art professionals. So it's a very different approach. Uh, this seminate, so the idea is that since uh, I mean, uh, this sector is extremely small and always extremely uh, bad funded, low funded, underfunded, uh, that's the term, you know, in order to make these initiatives, a private initiative, uh, sustainable, I mean, uh, we need to have a very good dissemination plan globally. So, the simulation plan is done, is done by publication, so we are outside academia, but we, we still publish in academic research. And, uh, but uh, our publication is basically to uh, sustain our tools. So, indeed, we have like this paper will be like a practical guide to this mail, a practical guide to panoramic multispectral image. So, basically, we also put uh, this package, we uh, uh, we provide to the, to the tools also an academic explanation with the paper. Practical notes on the, the, the one, technical recommendation on the other technique, and so on. So we have the persons as academia, we have of course our blog, uh, that is the main way we get in contact with uh, uh, other art professionals worldwide, so we have our energy visit, per day, increasing, newsletter, um, and then uh, art examination is uh, also what we do because uh, we provide this service. Uh, basically, we use the same equipment that we develop is the same equipment that we use actually to analyze the paintings for the museums, for our collectors, um, uh, uh, to analyze manuscripts. So we get con we test continuously the equipment that we make. You know? So 
every time God is saying, okay, we need these other things, these are to be changed, is a continuous improvement. Uh, and we know this, that we are specialized in uh, mobile equipment. So that's also is uh, uh, very specific because uh, I also in all the art professionals, they work, uh, they have a project in a church, restoration, then they have to go to the museum to do the restoration over there. So to have equipment that is a lightweight, that can be, uh, you can bring with you, like for this training, we did the, the three days just using a checked luggage and a carry-on luggage. That's all. Uh, and then uh, we have trainings, that's actually the main way we are diffusing these uh, technologies. Uh, they are aimed at a very diverse audience, conservators, fine art advisors, photographers, art historians, conservation scientists, so scientists that are devoted to these fields. So, and, and the idea is uh, to have just specific practical workflow. So we show how to do UV, for instance, we don't breathe with the physics of the UV fluorescent phenomenon. So it's aimed at a very uh, wide um, audience. And the goal is that after the training, this uh, institution that took the training of private uh, professional are ready to start after the training to operate this machine and introduce this work for in, the, um, in their uh, practice. So this is the list of people, for example, we had for this uh, training here three days ago in Puerto Rico. Uh, here, and uh, you see how the variety of uh, uh, professionals involved. So we start with Christine that has experience as a photographer and imaging in the museums, but also we have scientists, so we have, uh, we have Antonio, we have uh, Stephen and Johnny, actually who is a conservator, but he's dealing with scientists. <laughs> uh, uh, and then uh, we have uh, an object conservators, painting conservators, historical expert in historical documents here, uh, art museum of conservative expert in specific, specifically on painting, registers, registers that anyway, they, I mean, they, they are in small institution, like maybe this one, so uh, we have a which one was a museum of, um, uh, so basically in small institutions, in small museums, registers often are, they do anything, you know, they do the photography, they do the register, they, they clean up the things. So for them, to have small tools that can they, they improve the workflow is important. Um, and then we even had a digital artist that was interested in the imaging, uh, this uh, electronic stuff, how to implement this different UV in his uh, digital uh, creation. Um, okay, so international audience, yeah, I mean, so over the year, uh, the number of trainings in Milan has been uh, grown with this uh, wide, somehow, uh, wide audience worldwide taking this training. Um, yeah, this was the plan for the, the training we just did, so seeing all this technique that I introduced to you for one day for taking a photography, if a reflectography, a reflectography image, a spectroscopy, multispectral imaging a full day, uh, and it's the group, oh yes, uh, we are on the training. Uh, okay, uh, this is the game, we see, thank you, thank you, thank you.